So I would like to start, um, Sheriff Max is going to join us here in just a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to read you uh, the biography that we have for him just to give you a little background. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, Sheriff Richard Mack is the former sheriff of Graham County, Arizona, and was the first sheriff in the country to file a lawsuit against the Clinton administration to stop the intrusiveness associated with the Brady Bill. Mack's case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, where he won a landmark decision on the issue of states' rights and local sovereignty. Sheriff Mack is a fifth-generation Arizonan. His father is the late G. Wayne Mack, who served in the FBI in Arizona for nearly 25 years. Sheriff Mack grew up and attended school in Safford, Arizona, where he excelled in sports and music, and he graduated from Eastern Arizona College and Brigham Young University, where he obtained a BA degree in Latin American Studies and Sociology. Sheriff Mack spent 11 years with the Provo, Utah Police Department and then moved back to Arizona, where he ran for Graham County Sheriff in 1988. Excuse me. He was elected twice. While serving as sheriff, he received an invitation to attend the FBI National Academy and graduated from there in 1992. Since leaving the sheriff's office, Sheriff Mack has been a consultant and an author. He's written five books and as of the publishing of this biography, uh, had just recently released his first novel, which was called The Naked Spy. Uh, during the past decades, Sheriff Mack has spent much of his time helping people all across the country and the world who have been abused by government in one way or another. He has stood for the little guy against big government and corruption. He's appeared on shows such as Good Morning America, Nightline, Court TV, MSNBC, the Donahue Show, Crossfire, uh, Showtime, and oh, Showtime's The American Candidate. Sheriff Mack's experience as a lawman and his dedication to the American ideals of freedom make him a very unique and powerful voice for liberty. So that is Sheriff Mack in a nutshell. But he, I see he has joined us. Good evening, Sheriff Mack. How are you, sir? <laughs> Doing good, Peter. Good to meet you. I am doing well. Uh, my name is Peter Lupia. I'm going to be uh, conversing with you tonight. Is it okay if I just call you Sheriff? That's great. That's our, my nom de plume and nom de guerre. You our, very good. Very good. Thank you, sir. We appreciate that. So um, thank you for giving us your time this evening. And I know we've got a, a, a full room here of folks that are very interested in hearing what you have to say. In particular... Uh, we have a election coming up this year for our county sheriff, and so we've got six candidates. Uh, four of them have joined us here in the room tonight, so they're here to get the uh, constitutional sheriff. Actually, this is not a 101. This would be like a Ph.D. level class from you yes. tonight. <laughs> so thank you. Um, wanted to see, I, I went through your biography uh, from your book that's in your book, actually, and uh, we'll supplement that with some other things as we go along. But do you have anything you'd like to add that maybe we don't know or that wasn't there in what we just went through? Um, my favorite food is enchiladas. <laughs> That's good to know and sounds appropriate for Arizona. It is. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, we did mention and, and uh, touch on just briefly your case that went to the Supreme Court and was wondering if you could maybe give us a few minutes uh, just in more detail about that whole scenario and how that went and, and the ultimate results. Well, the ultimate result of that is that it was uh, based on uh, an absolute miracle. Uh, that I even ever ran for sheriff was a miracle. Uh, that I was elected sheriff was another miracle and one uh, Case in point is that uh, I'd never worked in law enforcement in the state of Arizona or my county. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I worked for Provo Police Department and I, I spent 11 years there. So I had not even lived in Arizona or my hometown for 12 years when I finally decided to move home and run for sheriff. Uh, this was not my idea. Uh, I may have done uh, that after I spent 20 years and got a retirement uh, with Provo, but um, 
we we felt that it was something we had to do and that we were supposed to do. Uh, it was an unlikely election. Uh, I barely won the the primary, and then I I I won by a, a well by ten percent in the general. <clears throat> and my wife would always talk to me, why why was there such a miracle? Uh, we spent the entire first term as sheriff. Um, and didn't seem like there was any special reason why I was supposed to be sheriff. And then the second term, uh, things started to become a little bit more vivid about that. In uh, January uh, 21st of 1994, uh, just a year after my second election, um, three agents of the BATF showed up at a meeting with of uh, the Arizona sheriffs. They handed each of us, uh, and, and there's only 15 counties in Arizona, so there's only 13 sheriffs at the meeting. So really, we didn't really need three BATF agents, uh, and everybody knows that's the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Uh, they regulate gun ownership in America, uh, which quite honestly is unconstitutional. Uh, their very existence is unconstitutional. Uh, but be that as it may, they came to the meeting and they handed us a document that uh, detailed uh, what our marching orders were. The sheriffs of Arizona are getting marching orders from the BATF per the United States Congress and Department of Justice telling us what we had to do to comply and enforce the Brady Bill. And this is the first time in American history where Congress and the president promulgate a, quote, law uh, that uh, commandeers the office, office of sheriff for federal bidding with a threat of arrest if we failed to comply. Now, all that's historic documented evidence. I'm not making any of that up. Uh, you can look up the case. Uh, Cornell University did the best review of the case, and I think it's still there. I haven't looked it up for quite some time. Uh, but I studied the case, and the uh, case that was analyzed by Cornell University Law School is the one that I studied the most. And I studied it and put all the highlights in this little booklet. It's pocket size. It's only 15 pages. You can read it in about 10 or 12 minutes. You should study it assiduously. Uh, because this decision is the most powerful anti-overreach of the federal government and the most uh, powerful Tenth Amendment decision in the history of America. Uh, I will be going through some of those quotes uh, from the case written by Justice Antonin Scalia, uh, God rest his soul, uh, and, and it amazed me. The whole decision amazed me. But so I put all the most important parts, the the highlights, the the parts that amazed me the most, and I put them in this little booklet, uh, which is available on my website at cspoa.org. Every American should have this in their pocket, and they should be studying this. Every sheriff candidate, every sheriff, every person in the county uh, who wants to know uh, what. What this is all about, you talked about this being a Ph.D. level. This case uh, will take you to that Ph.D. level. It is absolutely amazing. It's not difficult to understand, but it brings out some principles uh, of federalism that haven't been addressed in our country in a long time. Uh, this decision came out 24 years ago. It was June 27, 1997. This case has been used by lots of different states to go after uh, President Obama on some of his overreach and uh, now President uh, Biden uh, on his overreach. Uh, again, the most powerful state sovereignty uh, decision in the history of America. Uh, and and, I, and I've uh, not determined that just by myself, but uh, judges have said that, uh, that I've known uh, is some that I didn't know that just wrote me. Uh, constitutional attorneys have made the same uh, assertion. And I've done research on it, and I never found anything 
even close to this, except maybe for the New York versus U.S. case. Uh, and it's quoted in this one. Uh, so Scalia, I want everyone to understand this. Scalia didn't do what the Supreme Court usually does. And that is they follow political dogma and a political agenda. Scalia simply takes us through a very factual, historic lesson and uh, a lesson of, jur of historic jurisprudence. And he quotes the founding fathers. He quotes the Constitution and he quotes the Federalist Papers. And one, I will I will finish this part right now with the quote that he made from the Federalist Papers. He was talking about how if the state and the federal government are both dedicated to protecting liberty for the people, he said this. Hence, a double security arises to the rights of the people. The different governments will control each other. Did everybody hear that? The different governments will control each other at the same time that each will be controlled by itself. I think if there's anything we've learned the last two years, that many state governments and the federal government especially are not going to control themselves. And so who's, who is it up to? Who has the responsibility to put out of control government, overreaching government back in its proper lane? The different governments will control each other. There's your answer. There's your solution. And there's also a point to all sheriffs and all sheriff candidates that it is our job to make sure that the people in our county are not being abused by overzealous, overreaching, out of control, unconstitutional government. And this is one thing that I would, I would like to, to ask every sheriff in America, how is it that any sheriff could ever think that he is not supposed to adhere to, enforce, and obey the United States Constitution? That very Constitution requires by the supreme law of the land that each of us at the state and local and federal level, each of us in all three branches of government must swear an oath of allegiance to the United States Constitution, and indeed, every single one of us in government and every sheriff in this country has sworn a solemn oath in God's name that we will uphold, defend, protect, and preserve the United States Constitution. I find it extremely alarming that some sheriffs don't think they have to keep that oath. And that is extremely alarming. Absolutely. And I don't, I don't know if you can hear it, but you're getting yet another round of applause <laughs> during that uh, opening segment. And real quickly, because you mentioned it, I was negligent uh, to not recognize our uh, audience who is live streaming this event. And so also want you to know that uh, we reached out to the county sheriffs for the entirety of the state of Colorado to the best of our ability. So we hopefully have sheriffs not only here in the room uh, who are listening to you, but literally all over the state of Colorado that are participating tonight as well. So I thank you on their behalf as well. Wonderful. Do you have any um, opening thoughts or comments other than what I just asked you about that you'd like to um, share with us before we start questions? I, I'm, I'm always uh, uh, there for a lot more than what I just gave. And I certainly would like to uh, run through three uh, video clips Absolutely. Uh, as to what we really are about and, and what my presentation is. And I, I, I want everybody to know and understand this. I, I founded a national organization 11 years ago called the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. Um, I don't believe there's anyone, uh, any single sheriff in America that has ever heard me ask them to become a member. Uh, I've never wanted money or membership dues or anything else to get in the way of a sheriff just learning about the Constitution. The, the oath of office presupposes 
that a sheriff will know and understand the Constitution. It would be impossible to keep an oath to something that you've never read and that you don't understand. Uh, the Constitution is pretty easy to understand. Congress shall make no law. Uh, that's pretty easy to understand. The, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. <laughs> My right to remain silent is pretty easy to understand. The, the right, my right to due process as expressed in Amendment 6, uh, that uh, I get a speedy and public trial, that I get a jury, an impartial jury, that I get to know the, and understand the charges made against me, that I get to confront the witnesses against me. All of that's easy to understand. That I get a lawyer, that's easy to understand. And the Eighth Amendment, I think is is really pertinent to law enforcement that there there shall be no excessive fines or bail. Let's uh, see, all law enforcement. Let me ask you: Do we issue excessive fines and bail? Uh, how about traffic tickets? I'm not a big fan of traffic tickets, and most of the time they're used for revenue generation anyway. I'm not against the tickets, especially if they're done properly and constitutionally. But uh, one other one on that, no cruel and unusual punishment. I think I know what cruel and unusual punishment is. And if you look back at what the founding fathers had experienced under uh, King George III, it's pretty easy to see the cruel and unusual punishment was that was inflicted on uh, many of the colonists. And so, of course, they put it in the Eighth Amendment that you can't do that. And so, uh, again, easy ones. And the tenth one, of course, Easy to understand that uh, the power is not delegated to the federal. And that's a key word, delegated to the new federal government. The power is not delegated. Who delegated these powers to the new federal government? It was the states. The states formed the federal government, not the other way around. Where is it that it, it happened that the federal government decided it was our boss? And, there, and, and this case makes it very clear that the federal government is not our boss. And before we get to some of those clips, I'm going to make one other quote. I mentioned the New York versus U.S. case. It's quoted here in my decision. It came out in 1992. This decision of mine came out again in 1997. And Scalia quotes from that decision and says, We have held, however that state legislatures are not subject to federal direction, end quote. If we are not subject to federal direction, there is no way the federal government could be our boss. So, all right, so um, go ahead. There's lots of amens in the room right now. Yes, well, there should be. <laughs> and I think everybody would agree with your uh, opinion on traffic tickets as well. Well, the, the, I hope the sheriff candidates do, but there's something to look, still look at there. Uh, and look, uh, I, I know that there's righteous tickets out there. And I, I, I could talk for the next hour how to determine that. But I'll leave that for another time. Maybe uh, I'll get to know some of these candidates after they get elected and maybe we can go through that. I do want to uh, invite the candidates uh, to a national convention that we're going to have of the CSPOA. Uh, in September. So if each of them uh, would uh, want to get, uh, get a hold of me, I would like to get a hold of them, but it's really hard to keep track of all the candidates in every state. But uh, we would like to invite you uh, to this conference that's coming up September 30th in Las Vegas. So anyway, if, uh, if Peter, if you have somebody there and you're in that could give me all the information of the sheriff, sheriff candidates that are in the audience, uh, I'd be happy to extend that invitation to them. We'll, we'll make sure that they can get in, in touch with you. Thank Absolutely. You. Absolutely. With that said, I'm going to start us off with a couple of questions. So for the audience, since uh, we're doing this via Zoom, we have some questions uh, already wait, prepared. Wait, wait, wait. Peter, oh, yes, sir. What, uh, I'd like to show at least one of these clips before oh, I go into some questions. Absolutely. We are, we are ready. Would you like the first one right now? Yeah, the first one, go ahead. Okay. And, and just so everybody knows, this next clip 
is an example of what we are after at the CSPOA. This is all we're after. It's very simple, but it is powerful. And I want you to imagine while you watch this deputy in action, what if we had hundreds of thousands of peace officers just like Deputy Stan Lennick? Go ahead. The YouTube video going viral, posted on the internet by two activists who brought a camera into the Albany International Airport while they passed out flyers. Now, it led to a heated dispute over First Amendment rights. Beth Wortman has our top story. Beth? Hi, Benita. Well, as you'll see in the video clip, an airport spokesman tries to stop these activists from their mission. But a sheriff's deputy steps in to settle the confrontation and the right to free speech. So, hey everyone, this is Asha Jessica. I am here at Albany International Airport. The young woman is standing outside the security checkpoint at the airport, telling the camera that she's there to hand out flyers to travelers, reminding them of their right to opt out of getting the body scan, which she claims carries health risks. Okay, on your this is, hold on, hold on. First of all, turn this off right away. Airport spokesman Doug Myers tells the crew to stop videotaping and to go downstairs, which they agree to do, and they are confronted again. Do you have a million dollars insurance policy here? You're violating the airport authority guidelines. You haven't paid. That doesn't matter to us at all. Okay, you can check that out. No, you're in our airport. But as the tension builds, Sheriff's Deputy Stan Lennox steps in, separating the two parties, then lays down the your, law. Obviously, this is your constitutional right. Okay. As far as we're concerned, you're not breaking any laws. Okay. That's that's what we want to get across to you guys. Okay. Myers objects, ordering airport employees to allow only ticketed passengers upstairs. Stairs, accusing the activists of blocking the escalator. But once again, Deputy Lennox defends their First Amendment rights. Okay, so that we means we're doing it for, I yeah. told you who I am. Okay. I am Jason no. Burmes. Let me see you your identification. Clearly, I don't need to show you my he identification. He doesn't have to show you his identification. The activists continue their mission. The video later posted to YouTube and goes viral. Not the kind of attention Deputy Lennox is used to. That's a little overwhelming. Um, I mean, I was doing my job. I did the right thing. I, I felt I did the right thing. You know, protecting people's First Amendment rights. Wow. Uh, did you hear what he said when he first came up? We want you to know that this is your constitutional right. We want you to understand that you have broken no laws. You know, some people might ask, who died and made him judge, jury, and execution? He's not a lawyer. How can he say what constitutional rights are? That is exactly his job. He's the one that swore the oath. When you swear an oath, can you abdicate that oath, its fulfillment to someone else? He's responsible for that oath. He's the one that took it. When you, when you uh, go into court and you uh, take the oath to testify and tell the truth, can you get up on the stand and say, oh, well, I will tell the truth as long as the United States Supreme Court has made a decision that cops can tell the truth in court? Or as long as my sheriff tells me I can, I will. As long as my sergeant or lieutenant or captain, uh, as long as they give me permission, I'll tell the truth. Otherwise, I just have to do what I'm told. It, there's so many officers that are doing horrible things right now, uh, arresting uh, pastors and ministers and, and men of the cloth in Canada and in the United States. Sheriff Cronister arrested Pastor Rodney Howard Brown in Florida just for conducting church service. Oh, well, but but it's okay to arrest ministers uh, if they have church when they were told not to. Nobody in this country has any authority to tell anyone that they can have church. So. Big amen on this end of the end <laughs> I of heard the room. some of that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So so, so all we want is every deputy, every sheriff, every peace officer in this country to conduct himself with the knowledge with which Deputy Stan Lenny conducted himself. And that happened in 2013. And at our convention that year, later that year, we had Deputy Lenny come and accept the CSPOA Deputy Sheriff of the Decade. Uh, we were so proud of what he did that day and, and the example that he set. And we want everyone to understand the enforcement of the Constitution at every 
call that we make. And if we put our duty first to protect liberty and to protect rights, he even mentioned during the interview, I protected, I did the right thing. I protected their First Amendment rights, the right to peaceably assemble, the right to freedom of speech. And all of us tonight are exercising our First Amendment right to peaceably assemble and learn about liberty. But we need to understand that the church for all nations applies to one other principle. Liberty is for all nations and all people. And our duty as peace officers is to protect that right, to guarantee that right. So I'm grateful to be with uh, so many of you that believe in first the church for all nations and liberty for all nations. Amen. Thank you, sir. We are honored to have you here. So I, I know we have a couple of other uh, short videos. We'll, we'll call for those when you're ready for them as we go yeah, through, or do you yeah. want those now? Um, I might go, I might go with the second one. Uh, yeah, let's, let's go ahead. Um, no, I might wait for that one. Let's go ahead. Let's get to some questions. If I need to interrupt the questions, I will. Okay. That sounds, that sounds great. So, uh, in getting started, we had a, some recent events that uh, we had communicated about a little bit. Uh, one being this past November, uh, the FBI broke down the door of a, a lady here in Colorado, Sharona Bishop, who's known as America's Mom. And um, she's been active in parents' rights and voter integrity. Um, there was a warrant, but no charges, uh, but intimidation was involved. Uh, they handcuffed her, harassed her children, etc. And then there's another incident uh, where a woman involved in voter integrity was at the Capitol on January the 6th, uh, but was not actually in the Capitol building. And sheriff deputies were sent to her home by the FBI where they hassled her and her family. There was no warrant. There were no charges again. So those two incidents being our guide for these next couple questions. Question number one, um, are the feds required to inform a sheriff that they will be coming into his or her county to make an arrest, do search, or seizure? Only if the sheriff requires it. And there's no law of, about that. And first of all, federal agents, um, for their own safety and for the safety of the community, should already be doing that. You would think they would already be doing that. Uh, but I will tell you one incident where this occurred in a federal court case. Uh, Sheriff Dave Mattis in Bighorn County, Wyoming, had a family sue him because his deputies went with some uh, ICE agents. And this was under the this was under the during the Clinton administration. So it was some time ago. And uh, turns out that uh, the family they raided uh, were legal citizens of the United States, the Castaneda family, uh, the feds who had the wrong home. Uh, that happens often. Uh, and it seems to be uh, the MO of federal agencies that don't do their homework and go to the wrong home to, to serve warrants. They actually did have a warrant. If the FBI wants to go in and raid a home without a warrant, the sheriff should be stopping that. The sheriff should stand in the way. He should let everyone of, the, of federal bureaucracies know, if you come to my county and raid one of my citizens, first of all, you better check with me before you do it. And secondly, if you don't have a warrant, don't come in. You're not going to go just, uh, it, you know, I guess the FBI or any other cop can knock on someone's door. I would tell any citizen, if they don't have a warrant, close your door and, and go use the restroom. Uh, go about your business. And if they bust into your home after that, sheriff should be getting involved and you should call 911 and tell him you want a deputy sheriff there and the sheriff himself, if there's a way to get him there. Why I bring up Sheriff Dave Mattis in the lawsuit against the federal government and his office, the Castaneda family said that we want to make sure that the sheriff in, uh, implements a policy where this would never happen to anyone again in Bighorn County. Wyoming. And so the sheriff came up with a policy that every federal agent that comes into his county must check with him first. And they did it and they obeyed it. And the U.S. Attorney's Office locally 
told the sheriff, if they don't obey this, you let me know. That is exactly how it should be in every county. And every sheriff in this country should establish a policy with and let them know and put them on notice preemptively. If you come into my county, you better check with me first. If I find out that you're serving, uh, that you're raiding people's homes without warrants and due process, I won't let you come back again and I will take criminal action against you. And that needs to be every sheriff. Imagine, especially you sheriff candidates, imagine that literally half the sheriffs in this country were implementing that policy. Is there anything they could do about it to stop it? I mean, I I, I guess maybe they could all get their, their pride hurt. And But what are we after? What is the main goal? Protection of our citizens, protecting their liberty and protecting their safety and protecting them from rogue federal agents who believe they can do anything they want without following the law and that they're just doing what? Following orders. And uh, following orders comes right from the Nuremberg trials after World War II, where Nazi officers made that same claim when they were participating in the genocide against Jews and Christians and, and many other groups of people, mostly Jews. And their excuse was, you can't punish me. I was just following orders. That's most damnable excuse for committing crimes that I've ever heard. It didn't fly then and it shouldn't fly now. And let's just be real honest here. What the FBI has done in this country since Biden took office and what they've done since January 6th has been absolutely despicable. It's disgusting. And uh, I took a lot of heat for January 6th, but I will tell you this. I never went to the Capitol on January 6th. They, uh, news agencies all over the country were trying to find anyone there with a CSPOA hat or shirt or T-shirt. Um, they, they accused me of being there. And I said, you've got the wrong person. Because I told people, I told our people not to go. And then one reporter says, can you prove that? And I said, I don't have anything to prove to you. I didn't go. I didn't want to go. I didn't think anybody should go. Emotions were way too high for getting that many people together. And I didn't think it was a good idea. And um, you know, I didn't, I'm not saying anything about Trump. I mean, he can have as many rallies as he wants. I don't care. But I just didn't think that one was a good idea. And he only had two weeks to go in his office. And, and I just think it, it was an ill-timed event. Uh, I thought he was a very good president. Uh, comparatively speaking to the one we have in the White House right now, uh, <laughs> he was a uh, hundred times better. I mean, you can't even say it could be a thousand times better. But uh, it's sad the way things uh, unfolded there. And I was really disappointed with how it turned out. Uh, but the th thing I was disappointed about the most was the Capitol Police officer uh, who who killed Ashley Babbitt. Uh, if if she deserved to be uh, killed and if she deserved lethal force, then everyone else that went inside that building did too. And yet he said she deserved it. And that's why he shot and killed her. But he didn't shoot anybody else. Uh, and, and that's ridiculous. Uh, trespass is not a, a lethal uh, offense and, and crime. Uh, and obviously she was not armed, uh, nor was anyone else that uh, went into the Capitol that day, except for the officers mis misusing, uh, that, or the officer that misused his gun that day. Um, uh, anyway, that was really sad. Uh, I, I did not believe it was a good idea. And, and obviously the FBI has been acting like a bunch of Nazi Gestapo agents uh, since then, going after people, yet they they do very little to try to find the person who left a bomb at the DNC. There was a bomb placed at the DNC, and they're more concerned about trespass in the U.S. Capitol. Doesn't fit. The narrative has definitely gotten confusing. Uh, yes. So... Well, you answered actually all three of the questions around those scenarios in one answer. So thank you for that. You saved me some time. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to some of the other uh, questions that we had. Um, so the next one, the term constitutional sheriff 
has been maligned and mocked in the media. There mm-hmm. is no such thing uh, is one of the quotes. Sheriff is never mentioned in the Constitution is another quote, etc. cetera. Um, oh, those are some of the things that are being said. So where does the elected sheriff derive their power and authority? And what is the authority um, and how should they wield it? That's kind of a double well, part question there. Well, for, first of all, I, my mother would spank my mouth what I'm going to say next, but I'm going to tell you flat out that that sheriff isn't mentioned in the Constitution is stupid. Why would the federal Constitution address a county officer? Uh, and you'll find something else. The city council is not mentioned in the Constitution. The dog catcher is not mentioned in the Constitution. The state legislature is not mentioned in the Constitution. The governor, uh, the, the county commissioners, the county attorney, uh, he's not mentioned in there either, he or she. Uh, it's ridiculous to think that the Constitution is going to establish officers for the counties and cities and states. That's not their job. That wasn't the purpose of the Constitution. The purpose of the Constitution was to limit what federal agents and federal uh, officers in Washington, D.C. could do and not do. It is a set of rules and laws for them that protects us and our God-given rights, if they would just obey it. Now, the Office of Sheriff goes over, goes back in history to old Anglo-Saxon law, a thousand years ago. If you'll remember the story of uh, uh, Robin Hood and the the sheriff of Nottingham, uh, it shows also how horrible it can be that your sheriff is a bad person. However, the sheriff precedes our own American government. It precedes our constitution. It precedes the Bill of Rights and uh, the Declaration of Independence. The, the first sh- uh, the first officer of the law in America was a, a sheriff, a local sheriff. And three of the signers of the Constitution, I can remember one name, Oliver Walcott, who signed the Constitution, was a former sheriff. And so uh, the sheriff has always been, for a thousand years, the ultimate protector of the people. And he worked, uh, he worked at... Uh, at their behest. They, the people appoint the sheriff, he works for them, he is their protector, and he is the executor of the law. So we can clearly establish that the people give the authority to the sheriff, correct? The people bestow and grant and delegate all power to our public servants. The power and authority that all of us have in government comes from the people. And if you look at the end sentence of the 10th Amendment, it makes that very clear. All powers not delegated to the federal government, to the new United States Congress or federal government, remain with the states or the people. So if we go through the Constitution and look at how limited powers were that were delegated to the federal government, everything else belongs to the states and or the people. Amen. You're getting some amens in the room here again. Um, So let me ask the the second half of that and throw it back. So how should a sheriff be wielding that authority? How how should they enact the authority that's given to them? Well, first of all, it all boils down to the oath of office. What did you promise to do when you took your office You swore an oath in God's name and you promised the people that you work for that you will uphold and defend the Constitution. What does that do for them? (laughs) Well, it's the same reason why each of us and all three branches of government were required to take that oath, because the founding father's intent would be that if we all kept our oath of office, liberty of the people would be protected, safeguarded and perpetuated. And from generation to generation, the Constitution would still apply to every person within this country. It's a very sacred calling. It's a, an amazing duty. And it, it another thing that disturbs me is that most sheriffs in that position do not understand their position and their responsibility. Our responsibility is to do just what the 
Declaration of Independence says, quote, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Well, that almost sounds religious, doesn't it? That's because it is. Protecting the God-given rights and what God gave us as Americans and as his children throughout the world, the most precious gift we were given besides life itself was the power to control that life and to defend that life and thus the Second Amendment. And my job as sheriff is to make sure their rights are never violated and I will protect them from all enemies, both foreign and domestic. It doesn't matter who is making these threats or victimizing our citizens. It matters what is happening to them. And I will stand and put myself in the way and protect them. The sheriff's protection is a guarantee that this movement for freedom and to restore our constitution will indeed remain peaceful. If we have our sheriffs involved and that they understand the doctrine of interposition, that we put ourselves in the way. The criminal is here, the citizen is here, and I'm in the middle, and I stand firm in protecting my citizen, even as the good shepherd protects the flock, even the one that has strayed away, the sheriff will put his life on the line to protect the one or the many, doesn't matter. Either way, he is the good shepherd to protect the people in his county. And let me reiterate, if the sheriffs do this, this movement in America to get our freedom back and to be left alone, this will remain peaceful if the sheriffs do their jobs. Don't know if you can hear that. Another great round of applause. And that inner position. like some papers, uh, sh- roughly. <laughs> yeah, it's just me <laughs> doing that. Uh, <laughs> and that inner position you were talking about, I know there's a book out, uh, The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates. It yes, goes into one. that in, in great detail. So I would encourage all of our sheriffs and candidates, if you haven't seen that, to definitely get a copy and familiarize yourself. Um, moving on to the next question. So there is now ample and compelling reason to believe that the 2020 election here in Colorado was not conducted lawfully and that state and federal statutes regarding the preservation of election records and data were violated. In the absence of investigations and enforcement by the Attorney General, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and the local district attorneys, could sheriffs take action to investigate wrongdoing and secure our elections? One word, Peter, one word, absolutely. And we've had a couple of sheriffs in the country do it. Uh, And their investigations have been laughed at and scoffed at uh, by the proper prosecutors. Uh, I don't want to know the opinion politically of any prosecutor. I don't give a damn about his opinions. I want him to look at the evidence presented to him in in any investigation and make a determination if there's sufficient evidence to bring charges against these people. That's what every sheriff in the country should be doing uh, with any type of evidence of uh, voter fraud in his county. Every sheriff has a responsibility to investigate and stop any and all fraud or uh, voter irregularities. I don't know that there were any. I've never seen any specific evidence. I can tell you there's a a sufficient, uh, what kind of evidence? Coincidental evidence uh, is not coincidental. It's anyway, all the coincidences that come together uh, in the election of of last year, uh, or now year, year, in 2020, uh, there's just too much there to ignore. And, and, and so, yes, we absolutely have the responsibility to investigate that crime. And what I would suggest to citizens is take any evidence that you have of criminal activity or voter fraud, take it to your sheriff and ask him to investigate it. Uh, let's go back, though, a little bit before that. Is there anyone in this country that honestly believes there is a reason we use computers to tabulate voting in this country? 
Why do we use computers? Is there anyone in this country, Democrat, Republican, or anything in between, that doesn't know that computers are very easily hacked? We have a long history of, of major companies and even major government a- entities, including the Pentagon, that have had their computers hacked. Some of them were done by 15-year-old kids. Folks, there is no government purpose. There is no service to the American people or local people. I don't care. There is no purpose that we are that government thinks they're serving me somehow by using computers to tabulate votes. Who does that serve? Who does that help? What government purpose is being uh, implemented or fulfilled by using computers or computerized voting? It's a joke. It's stupid. It's 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 probably unconstitutional, even though founding fathers didn't anticipate that would ever happen. We need to make sure that there's a paper ballot for every person who votes and that there should be some sort of identification that puts that person to that ballot in case I in case anyone ever needs to go back and verify how the votes happened. I can say that is my ballot. It's got my number right there on it. And yes, that's how I voted. Using computers is where we came up with all of this problem to begin with. So you got another big round of applause on that. And I'm going to agree with you wholeheartedly on exactly what you just said. So thank you for that. Um, So I'm going to actually follow up to that just a little bit. So when the sheriff does their investigation and they take it to their local district attorney and they refuse to act, what's what what would be their next steps in the chain to uh, look for prosecu- prosecution? So if the county attorney says no, he won't do it? Correct. Uh, then you try the uh, state AG or you try to give your evidence to a neighboring county sheriff and see if he has the same uh, problems there, and maybe he has a, a friendly uh, prosecutor. Uh, because, like, like, say, if sheriffs in California start this investigation, if their county attorney refuses, then he gives it to the state. You're not going to get anywhere with the state AG in California. So then you, you ask uh, a local uh, attorney general of the United States, the one in California. Are they going to do it? Not under Biden, they're not. And it's obvious that nobody really wants to investigate this. The national media don't want it investigated. They want to say, oh, how could you be questioning this? Well, I could give you some uh, circum- uh, there it is, circumstantial evidence that uh, Biden won 15 million more votes than did Obama. And yet he lost 215 counties more than Obama did. He lost 215 counties, but got 15 more million votes. That's kind of a surprise. I'll bet that's never happened in the history of voting anywhere. That you lose 215 counties, but you gain 15 million votes. So there's some circumstantial evidence that I was trying to uh, spit out when I couldn't remember the right word. (laughs) <laughs> it's very circumstantial, but yes, it's enough uh, to prompt uh, a legal investigation, and it should have already been done. Uh, Barr, when he was AG for, for Trump, said that there is no evidence of wrongdoing that would have uh, changed the outcome of the election. Yet he never he never said how he knew that. He never said how he knew it. Show me the investigation, AG Barr. Show me your investigation. He never did one. So A.G. Barr, I'll tell you, you're a liar and you lied to the American people and you should be prosecuted for that. You committed perjury as per your position. And and, uh, that's a joke that no one has conducted investigation except Sheriff Smaling in Wisconsin and Sheriff uh, Leaf in Barry County, Michigan. So the only two investigations I know, both of them have significant evidence. And so far, both of them have been turned down by prosecutors. And so what are we so afraid of? 
Why don't we, you would think that in the recount in Arizona that we had out here, that the Democrats would have been thrilled to have a court case and a recount to prove that all the Republicans and Trump were crazy. Yet they sued to stop the recount. They didn't cooperate at all. They, they wouldn't cooperate. And then they would say, we're totally cooperating. A bunch of liars in the county commissioners, the board of supervisors here. And it was a farce. And I told everybody to begin with, both sides are going to claim victory in the recount. That sure is. That's what happened. But when no one will follow up or do anything about it, it stops. And this is all an indication of the type of corruption that we're dealing with throughout our country. And especially, you want a pandemic? I'll give you a pandemic, Peter. The pandemic we have right now is one of utter corruption. And the epicenter of that corruption is Washington, D.C. Zero disagreement in this room. I can tell you that, Sheriff. <laughs> and, and you better have a sheriff that is willing to stand and make sure that that corruption does not saturate your county or even allowed in your county whatsoever. And first, if you want to make sure that you don't have any ties to Washington, D.C. corruption, do not take any of their bribes. Do not take any of their federal grants. I never did in the eight years I was sheriff. You can run your own office and you should not take any of these strings attached, mandate attached uh, federal grants. They are bribery and you need to make sure that your office stays autonomous and independent of any of that tomfoolery from Washington, D.C. So you just did a fantastic job of leading yourself right into my next question. Okay. Uh, so, can a sheriff investigate a crime committed by a federal agency? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it needs to be, though, that it was actually committed in in his county. Uh, so, a lot of these, a lot of people have said, "Well, why can't he do an investigation on on uh, Biden?" Well, you probably could, uh, especially if you had a county that was on the border. Um, if any of his mandates have turned out to hurt people locally. Well, that's, yeah, that's going to happen. Uh, but taxes do that too. And the IRS has committed uh, thousands of crimes during the last 40 years in America. And they continue to uh, victimize Americans and, and go after us illegally. Does, does everybody know that the very premise of the existence of the IRS is totally unconstitutional? Now you sheriff candidates uh, and you sheriffs pay attention here. Can any of us in law enforcement uh, just go check out a home that we think is cooking meth or dealing drugs of any kind, that they're doing fentanyl and they're distributing fentanyl to kids and we don't know it, but it just looks like it. And so we go and perform a, an audit and we go in in that home. And we say, we're here to conduct an audit and we're going to audit your home. Uh, and the people say, uh, do you have any probable cause? No, we've heard some rumors, but uh, no, we don't have any probable cause. We're just going to conduct an audit. And why is it that we accept that from the IRS? The IRS conduct about 250,000 audits on American citizens every year. What do you know? 90% of them produce more taxes that those people have to pay. 90%. So uh, how is it that we are going, as sheriffs, are going to allow the IRS to conduct unconstitutional audits on our citizens with no probable cause, uh, no, not even a reasonable suspicion? They just conduct these audits. And every citizen should refuse them. And every sheriff should protect his citizen in that right. There is no constitutional authority for that. Even though the Supreme Court may have endorsed it, they're wrong. Do you want me to count how many times the Supreme Court has been wrong? I could count probably a half dozen just in the last year. But I could count some real big ones, like the Supreme Court saying that it's a constitutional right to kill a child in the womb. 
That's one of their big mistakes. Uh, probably the biggest one they've ever made. But can you see how debased and how far we've gone that the Constitution is actually used to allow a woman to kill a child in her womb? And that's her constitutional right to do so? Folks, we need to get back to the basics. And uh, the Plessy versus Ferguson uh, case allowed segregation to continue in America for over 50 years after that decision. 50 years we went along with the Supreme Court because they said separate but equal doctrine. In other words, they said, uh, as long as you're getting equal stuff, it's okay that you're segregated. So separate but equal. So you dark equals are over here and you light equals are over here. And that's just how it was for f over 50 years because we went along with the Supreme Court. Is there anything we can do to stand against uh, that? Do you know that I still have to keep my oath and enforce the Constitution, the Supreme Court notwithstanding? There is no authorization in the Constitution for the Supreme Court to interpret the Constitution. They have the same, they take the same oath that you and I do. They are supposed to enforce and obey the United States Constitution. All they are is political hacks now. In my decision, it was the five Republicans who sided with me and the four Democrats that sided with Clinton. Why? That totally blew me away and it totally offended me. I thought we all apply the Constitution and the intent of the founders. And believe me, when they do it wrong, we have no obligation to go along with unconstitutional edicts or mandates or Supreme Court orders. What comes first in America? What comes first? God-given liberty. And I will stand and protect and interpose and protect my citizens from rogue, unconstitutional, out of control, overreaching government, despite the Supreme Court. I am under no obligation to go along with unconstitutional, out of control, federal judges, federal agents, federal bureaucrats, or the president of the United States in my county. The Constitution will be adhered to, obeyed, and enforced. Yet another round of agreement on this end in a very uh, enthusiastic way. So thank you for that. Um, I do want to remind you we have your other videos, so just let me know when you want to. Let's, wanna... let's, uh, I, I, let's see, what, what time is it? Gonna... We are, uh, well, 8 o'clock okay, local. Yeah, we're getting... We're getting close to the end, and I and I think we, we better play. I want the last one on there played. We're not going to do the middle one. Go to the last video clip and and go ahead and do that now. And and whoever's running it, Jared or whoever, I might stop it at, at an earlier point. We might not. We won't need to look at the entire video. So I'll just let you know, Peter, and you can tell him to stop it if he can't hear me. Very good. Okay. All go right. ahead and play. Go ahead, team. I can't hear the sound. Let me have those front seats. Well then you just do it. You gotta exercise your powers and put her on. Alright, man. 
Okay, you can stop it. Alright, thank you so much. Can you hear me, Peter? Yes, sir. Um, everybody knows what that was about. Everybody's heard of Rosa Parks. She's in every uh, grade school, uh, middle school, high school, and college uh, history books. What we have failed to do is point out that government arrested her. That Two officers, sworn officers, sworn to uphold and defend the Constitution, arrested this woman for not giving her seat to a white man. She's an American citizen. I had it as a goal of mine to meet her one day before she passed away and shake her hand and thank her for what she did. But folks, I think we need to put the blame of this where blame belongs. First of all, Martin Luther King was arrested 29 times, 29 times. It was government officials that arrested him. It was government officials who killed innocent protesters at Selma, Alabama. We didn't get it until it was too late almost. And now we have the left who says that Rosa Parks is a hero and that Martin Luther King Jr. was a hero, and yet now, who's violating the civil rights of all Americans today? All in the name of taking care of us. Do you want to know what should happen now? We should stand in the way and prevent government abuse. What should have happened that day? Let me tell you what those two officers should have done. And I would hope that we would put ourselves in their place. What would every cop do? What would every sheriff in America do? If you were called back into time and you were at Montgomery, Alabama, December 1st, at about 6.30 in the evening in front of the theater next to Santa Claus, December 1st, 1955, I was three years old. This happened in my lifetime, which I can't even fathom that either. Those two officers, if we would have had Deputy Stan Lennick on that bus, what would have happened that day? We want you to know this is your constitutional right. These two officers should have sat down next to her and shook Rosa Parks' hand and thank her for her courage. And then those two officers sit down with her until she gets off the bus and then they escort her home safely and they make sure that she and her family are safe and receiving extra patrol to make sure that no one is harassing them or trying to lynch her or burn her home down or burn a cross in her yard or anything else that we will stop that kind of abuse then and now and that we don't arrest pastors and reverends for having church and that we don't arrest people for not wearing a diaper on their face. And that we protect our children from that kind of crap in our schools. And that we protect parents who go to school boards and let them know how they feel. And those school boards 
want to arrest parents for that. And that we should have sheriffs in every one of those school board meetings and making sure that their right to peaceably assemble is being protected and the right to free speech is being protected against a school board that works for them. Yeah. Folks, do we have anybody in government anywhere? Do we have sheriffs and patrol officers, city councils, state reps, county attorneys? Do we have anyone in government that knows, uh, that is sensitive and honest enough and to know when we've gone too far? Rosa Parks was an example of when we went too far, and that was just 65 years ago. Folks, let's not repeat the, the stupid mistakes of the past. We learn from history, so we won't do that. And so our job as sheriffs and anybody else in government is to protect the rights of the people. Rosa Parks was taken to jail, photographed, booked into a cell, and later on, NAACP bailed her out. Folks, she shouldn't have been in there in the first place. And we should stand for Rosa Parks today, the gun owner, the parent who wants to be in charge of their child's education and health and well-being. And now the state has assumed that role, has stolen that role, has taken it from us, and even has arrested, they've expelled, they've suspended children who don't wear a diaper on their face? Is this a free country or is it okay to sacrifice liberty for COVID-19 mandates and measures? These aren't even laws. We have police out here in Arizona who arrested citizens at a school board meeting out in the parking lot, not inside, in the parking lot, because the, the, the cops and the police were there to keep the peace. So they arrested people without cause. And it, uh, I've seen the case. I've seen too many of these. We've got to turn this around. And it's our job to do that. The rights of the people come first. The Constitution comes first. My oath comes first. And I'll, I'll close my part of this with the last line of the Declaration of Independence. Let's hear from the founding fathers to close my part. And it it goes like this. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Thanks so much for having me tonight, Peter. Sheriff, we... Purely, thank you very much. It has been our honor to have you here. I'm going to join the folks here that are giving you a standing ovation and just tell you again, thank you very much for spending time with us. We're going to promote your book here a little bit and uh, make sure remind folks have everyone, Remind everyone that they can join the CSPOA, make do donations at the CSPOA. We're going to make that big conference available this year that we've got to raise money for. And I mean, some real significant money. We really need donations, more members on our CSPOA and, and folks, everybody can join the CSPOA. Thank you so much uh, for your support uh, tonight. And, and thanks for having me. It's been a real honor. Again, our pleasure and our honor, sir, to have you with us. Thank you very much. And so ladies and gentlemen, uh, we do have available in the back. The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope, by our guest this evening, Sheriff Richard Mack. Uh, $10, I believe, is the cost for that. So hopefully, as a candidate, you've got one in your hands. If not, please pick one up on the way out. Um, I wish we had another hour with him or two hours, but his, his time was limited. Uh, we've got some other questions that were fantastic. But let me just say again, on behalf of the... Um, CIT, the Cultural Impact Team here at Church for All Nations. We thank you guys for joining us tonight. Uh, we do these to hopefully bring education and information to you all.